Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Our topic for today will be on knee osteoarthritis. I'm Mary Ambach. I am just waiting for Dr. Rogers to log in. He should be logging in any minute right now. Um, but for those of you who have attended our webinars in the past, I mean, you know how it goes. We start with the lecture or the presentation that will last about maybe 20 minutes or so. And then at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A button um, and just click on that at any time during the presentation or even now, if you have some burning questions on uh, knee conditions and how cell therapies um, help you, just go ahead and type those questions now. You can start as early as now, um, but we're going to get to them at the end of the presentation, and we're just going to get to them in chronological order. So um, once you you are ready, just, just go in and type those questions. There's also a comment button, I believe. Um, you can use that too, but the Q&A button would be the, the best one to use. Um, let me get our slides ready so we can start. I'm just going to give him a few more minutes. Um, but this afternoon, our topic will be on knee pain. This is the most common condition that we see in clinic. And, um, and so we haven't discussed this in a while. So we thought we'd bring it back since patients um, always ask us these questions. Um, so I think it will be a, a great time to, to start it. Okay, Dr. Rogers is here. Good day. All right, I'm, I'm going to start, Dr. Rogers, and then um, I'll cue you in on when you can start. I will share my screen. Let me know if you see the screen. You see that okay? Yes. Okay. All right, so as I said, our topic for today will be on non-surgical management of knee pain most common orthopedic condition that we see in clinic. Um, we've discussed this in the past, but we thought this would be a good time to uh, bring it back since we see these patients every day. It's the most common thing that we see in clinic. Uh, you see Dr. Rogers here joining me. He is the founder of our practice, San Diego Orthobiologics Medical Group. Um, I've met Dr. Rogers probably about five years ago or more. Um, we, we lecture in the same conferences. We teach... Uh, in the same conferences. Um, and I joined him about four years ago. Um, Unbelievable how time flies. I know, it's a long time now. But we've got the same training. We're board certified physical medicine rehab. Uh, we also did uh, fellowship training in um, spine and uh, sports medicine. Um, he started this practice, joined him about four years ago. We have the same passion for teaching. Um, doing research and just moving the field of regenerative medicine forward. Um, as I said, we, we met uh, doing these conferences where we teach, uh, we do cadaver trainings to teach other physicians on how to do this. Uh, we lecture in, in conferences. We published um, articles and book chapters in regenerative medicine. And now we're growing. There's four of us now. Um, Dr. Diaz Molina joined us and Dr. Uh, Evangelista all joined us all very qualified to do the same procedures that we do. They also have the same uh, specialty as we do. Um, and in addition, they're also um, specialized in sports medicine. Um, so great doctors, there's now four of us, um, more, more um, physicians to treat you um, so that you don't have to wait too long to see us. Yeah, our right, goal is to train as many doctors as possible. I don't think most people realize that regenerative medicine is still not taught in medical school. It's most residency programs do not uh, incorporate it, although that's fortunately changing. Or recently, we're seeing more and more of this taught in formal the formal training years. But yeah, Dr. Ambach and I and Dr. Evangelista and Diaz, we had to travel all over the country and learn all these, you know, all these little tricks that we've learned uh, to improve the outcomes. So in, um, in San Diego, uh, this is our beautiful clinic in Carlsbad. 
Uh, we've got a huge. Oh, you got to hit play. Button. Sorry to interrupt. You got to hit play, and because it's not, it didn't advance to the next slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, there my resume share. How about that? Nope. Not on my end. Are you seeing that? No, I'm just seeing your first slide. Just and, the first slide. And it's not in play mode. You got to. Okay. Let me stop my share. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Share screen. How about that? Can you see that? We're good. OK, perfect. Did you see this? No. Oh, you didn't see this? I'm <laughs> sorry. Those are the doctors that Dr. Ambach was talking about. <laughs> <Our call. laughs> oh. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the conferences uh, Dr. Rogers and I teach. These are the book chapters that we've um, we've contributed on and counting. These are the other two doctors that have joined us. There's now four of us. That's Dr. Molina right next to me, and then there's the Dr. Evangelista. Uh, and this is our beautiful clinic in Carlsbad. And I think a lot of you have uh, been to this clinic. Our huge procedure room um, that has all the technology that's needed to uh, do the procedures accurately and precisely. We've got the fluoroscopy on the right there where we can image your spine and other bony structures uh, for our procedures. And then on the left there, you can see the ultrasound machine. Uh, a lot of you are probably aware of where we can see soft tissues. We can do diagnostics diagnostic testing and a lot of cool stuff but that's the main thing that we use for our procedures um and then we have our uh on-site laboratory this is where the magic happens um you can see here on the upper right we've got the uh this this uh the, what do you call this thing it's called the laminar hood and basically what it does is it, it takes away all the keeps out all the airborne contaminants and it, it it makes it sterile so that we can process your tissue in a sterile environment uh, on the bottom right here we have a cell counter um, so that we can analyze the different components of the cells that we use in your prp and your um, uh, cell therapy and then on the left there, you've got all the centrifuge machines that we used uh, to process your cells. We make this point, sorry to jump in, we make this point with the counting of the platelets because um, again, I don't think most people realize there are more than 60 FDA approved PRP uh, systems. You know, it includes a centrifuge and some other equipment to make the PRP, but only about one third of the systems actually uh, collect enough platelets to be effective for things like knee arthritis. So we want our patients to understand that there's a uh, good, better, and best in anything. And when it comes to PRP, your doctor has to make it the right way and count the cells to make sure that there are the number of platelets in there that, that we say are in there. Yeah, so that's that's what I call the SDOMG difference. Uh, <laughs> so we actually customize your cells depending on what your condition is and what um, what we're treating. Right. So let's get on. Let's get on to uh, our topic. So we're talking about knee pain. Um, let's start with all the different causes of joint pain. Um, I know majority of you have knee osteoarthritis, uh, but let's not forget that there's also other things that can cause joint pain. And there's a, a whole list of them, including uh, rheumatologic conditions right, like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus any genetic conditions that makes your joints lax, connective tissue disease. There's other illnesses like gout or pseudogout that can also cause knee pain, um, some vascular disorders. Diabetes, mind you, causes actually joint pain and other nerve conditions, some blood disorder and some uh, nerve disorders. Um, so when you see us for the initial evaluation, we make sure that we roll out all these other things before we provide the treatment for your um, osteoarthritis. We wanna make sure there's no other coexisting condition that can um, add to your pain and treat that accordingly. Um, so osteoarthritis, our topic for today, it's a chronic inflammatory condition wherein um, it creates uh, wearing out or degeneration of this cartilage that's protecting your joints. Um, and over time, as the cartilage wears out, the space in your joint decreases, there's less volume of that uh, fluid that cushions your joint, 
Um, and then the other lining, which is the synovium and the capsule also starts to become worn out and strained. And then for worst uh, conditions, the bone underneath the cartilage actually starts to get bruised up and starts to get degraded too. So those are what we call level four um, osteoarthritis, which is the, the severe kind of, of arthritis. Um, and they can, there, there's a genetic component to it, but um, a majority of the time it is from chronic years of wear and tear, overloading, um, you know, proper, improper biomechanics, and uh, just, you know, it's like a tire, you know, we wear out our joints and over time it just kind of uh, gives out on us. I would add, uh, if I may, I would also add that what you don't see in that picture microscopic cells, your immune system cells, uh, you heard Dr. Ambach say that it's a chronic inflammatory condition. That means that there are certain immune cells that are uh, overactive in the joint and are adding to the degenerative process and adding to the inflammation and pain of the joint, which is why cortisone can sometimes provide temporary relief because it impairs the immune system temporarily. Uh, but that's, that's, that's the big discovery of the last 15 years is the interaction between the the bones and the cartilage uh, and the immune system. Yeah, so there's this imbalance of um, of abnormal cells and normal cells <clears throat> in your joint, and that's what we're gonna we're gonna discuss that later on how the cells uh, actually creates a homeostasis homeostasis or balance of this uh, good cells versus the bad cells. Um, you're familiar with the meniscus; it's also a cushioning um, that helps. Uh, the cartilage in uh, uh, protecting your joint. And the meniscus is that, that thickened cartilage that that's a cushion, acts as a cushion between your shin bone and your thigh bone. And when your cartilage is worn out, your meniscus gets overloaded. So majority of the times you also see tears in the meniscus when you have arthritis in your joints. A lot of patients come to us uh, saying, oh, I've got a meniscus tear. Um, you know, is that my problem? I'm hurting in my knee. Um, there are a lot of patients with no knee pain that has meniscus tears. So um, although they are concomitant, concomitantly found, a majority of the time, it's really the osteoarthritis that's causing your knee pain and not necessarily the degenerative meniscus tear. Um, other things around your joint that can contribute to pain um, would be tendinitis, which is inflammation of the tendons, uh, which is the structure that connects your muscle to your bone. There's also uh, bursitis. Uh, bursitis is uh, the inflammation of the bursa, which is that sac that cushions your bone from the soft tissue around it. And the sprain of your ligaments. Uh, ligament is what connects your bone to your bone. And whenever you don't have a good protective um, cushioning in your joint, all these structures around your joint gets overloaded and overworked. So they become sprained, they become inflamed, um, so they can cause pain as well. And, and this is one reason why patients with knee replacement um, come to us because they still continue to have knee pain. And that's because they still have all these other concomitant structures that um, contribute to their pain that can get inflamed even after a knee replacement. So uh, standard treatment for osteoarthritis uh, would include, you know, self-care. Majority of the patients that we see in clinic, they've tried to treat this, you know, for several weeks um, and only come to us when they're not better. Um, so modalities like heating pad and ice help decrease inflammation, modifying your activities with rest, elevation, some supportive device to, uh, to decrease pain and give you comfort can also help. Um, and um, therapeutic exercises. Uh, your primary care physicians usually are good at prescribing you physical therapy. Uh, obviously, the, the quality of the physical therapy that you get depends on the skill and training of your therapist. So that's also an important part of your treatment. Uh, so you've got your home exercise program, some water-based therapy for those who fail, land-based uh, physical therapy also works well for osteoarthritis. Uh, and then um, steroid injection um, is, is the most common injection that patients uh, received whenever they have a flare-up of their joint pain. 
Um, one, because insurance covers for it. Um, two, it's the, one of the most common uh, treatments that are available right now for joint pain. The advantage of steroid is it does give you immediate relief. It gets rid of that inflammation. Dr. Rogers was talking about uh, getting rid of the, all those inflammatory proteins that are in your knee, um, but it provides short-term relief. You know, if you're lucky, you get maybe four, six months relief, but most of the time it only gives you a couple months relief. Um, the big thing here is tissue injury. Um, there's a lot of studies showing that it does degrade your, your cartilage more. Uh, it's toxic to the lining of your knee joints. So it makes your arthritis worse over time. Uh, it also affects your, um, your hormones. It, it, you know, it creates hormonal imbalance with your estrogen, your progesterone, testosterone. Uh, it makes your bones more brittle. Uh, so if you have osteopor osteoporosis, um, we actually make sure that you don't have, you don't get a lot of this in, in a year. Um, because it makes you more prone for a fracture. And uh, with COVID and all these uh, things going on, you know, it decreases your immune response. So you always have to weigh the risks and the benefits of getting uh, a cortisone injection. Um, so now there's this uh, new um, innovative treatment uh, that's called regenerative uh, medicine or cell-based therapy um, that we use for osteoarthritis. And the idea is that our body can repair itself. We have cells in our body that can repair tissues. And what we're doing is we're using those cells from your own um, body to help uh, heal your, your injuries using these natural um, cells. So the orthobiologics is um, what is called for cells and substances that are produced by, by our own cells that we use to treat orthopedic conditions. And they comprised of platelets, which is the majority of the cells that we use in clinic. Um, other cells also include stem cells, some growth factors, and a lot of other proteins and molecules uh, that we use to improve orthopedic conditions. And that's why our clinic is called San Diego Orthobiologics Medical Group. Uh, this is our focus, is to use all these cells that are involved in healing and repair to treat your injuries. Uh, so let's start with PRP. Uh, PRP, um, or platelet-rich plasma, is this concentrated solutions of platelets um, that contains thousands of growth factors which are involved in healing. So when we centrifuge your whole blood, we, it separates your whole blood into these different layers um, of cells. And we take out the platelet layer, which is what we use for the injection. We concentrate this to anywhere from four to eight, 10 times more than your body concentration and, um, and deliver this super physiologic amount of platelets um, and inject it into your injured tissue. And these platelets stimulate uh, your healing cells. They attract stem cells to go to the area. Um, they stimulate uh, blood vessel formation, um, stimulates tissue regeneration, and decreases pain and inflammation. So it makes you feel better immediately while all this uh, repair process is ongoing. So Dr. Rogers was talking uh, about this. Uh, this is actually one person wherein they, they took his whole blood and they used different PRP systems to make PRP. And as you can see, there's, you know, there's different um, samples that can be obtained using different PRP devices. I think the count now is 64. There's about 64 different centrifuge systems in the market. Yeah, that's right. Um, and yeah, and only about a third to a half of these devices do not make uh, enough PRP sufficient to treat um, osteoarthritis. So it's very important um, to make sure that you get the right kind of PRP. Um, right. I could go, sorry, I'm gonna interrupt you. Go back to that slide. Uh, the one on the right there, you see is very red. That's because it's, they did not remove the red blood cells as they should have. Whereas the one on the far left is more yellow. All, most of the red cells have been removed. And there's good evidence that red cells are not good for the joint. They have, they, you know, red cells contain iron. Iron is toxic to cartilage tissue. So whenever a joint is injected with PRP, it should never look like that PRP on the right. Uh, it should look more like the light yellow color. Uh, and, and as Dr. Ambach alluded to earlier, we actually count how many platelets, how many red cells, how many white cells are in that PRP that 
we're manufacturing for you. So this PRP heal osteoarthritis, um, right now is the number one orthopedic condition that PRP works the best. Uh, there's, it's just, it just has the most data to support its use, um, I think more than any other surgical intervention um, for knee OA. So right now there's a, more than 40 uh, randomized controlled clinical trials, which is the gold standard of, um, of studies that you can uh, do to evaluate efficacy, um, and um, of treatments. So um, more than 40 of these high quality studies showing that PRP actually uh, significantly relieves pain and uh, improves function in these patients. Um, initial studies were showing that PRP is superior to, um, I'm sorry, that PRP is, is better with mild to moderate osteoarthritis, but there's, there's some data that is coming out now that is also actually uh, effective for uh, moderate to severe osteoarthritis. So it mm -hmm. just depends on your uh, condition. We can still opt to use it. Um, and uh, many, many uh, research showing that PRP is superior to steroid use and uh, superior to those gel injections that you've been getting, uh, also called hyaluronic acid or, or, or HA injections. Um, and the studies on PRP and and orthobiologics now is getting more granular such that we're actually getting into what is the right dose to create an effective treatment for specific orthopedic conditions. For example, for knee osteoarthritis, we're finding now that your PRP must contain at least about five to 10 billion platelets in order for it to be effective. And so again, not to belabor the fact, but we need to count our cells to be able to know, you know how much platelets we're giving you to know if we're gonna be effective or not. Um, and then patients also asked us, you know, does it improve my cartilage? Does it improve my uh, arthritis? Does it create structural changes? Um, not for everybody, um, about probably half of the studies that you see um, on PRP, um, and knee osteoarthritis will have uh, imaging studies improvement. Um, but even those patients who didn't have any structural improvement in their knees uh, improved in their pain and function. And that's because osteoarthritis is a complex uh, problem. There's, there's a lot more to it that's ongoing into the joint uh, that actually is involved in causing uh, pain and dysfunction. But this is one of those studies where in the MRI actually showed changes uh, after a PRP injection. Uh, again, this is a high quality study. It's a double blind uh, randomized controlled study wherein they compared a PRP injection um, with exercise. Um, 23 patients, 46 knees were injected. And after eight months, they MRI these knees that were treated. Uh, I think these patients received two PRPs a month apart. And they have shown improvement in the cartilage volume beneath the kneecap. So if you can see the picture here on the upper left, you can see a thinning of that cartilage under that kneecap. Um, and on the right is the after um, um, picture. And you can see a, a thickening of that cartilage. And um, this bottom here is a, I think it's a 3D slicer software wherein they analyze the, the actual cartilage under the kneecap. And you can see all the spaces where the, the worn out cartilage is. And then after the PRP tre treatment, you can see more um, cartilage tissue there um, in about eight months. So not only is the cartilage volume increased, um, they were also able to show that the synovial lining of the joint actually improved uh, and decreased its inflammation, which typically you know, is the one that's causing your pain. Uh, and also more importantly, the patients who were treated had improved uh, pain and function. So now let's go to other cells that we can use to treat uh, osteoarthritis and Dr. Rogers will talk about this one. Okay, great. So we'll talk about um, some other orthobiologics. I think we'll just focus today on stem cells now become a household word. Uh, and uh, I, I, we use the term stem cells, but I'd just like to say at the outset that this is not the correct term. St uh, the, the stem cells um, that you had when you were an infant and growing into a child and then a teenager and then an adult, those stem cells um, 
are different than the stem cells that we have in our body currently that are used for healing our injuries every day. But we just use the word stem cells because everybody kind of knows what we're talking about. It's a cell that's important for healing. <laughs> so, oh, you're gonna have to advance the slide for me. Uh, so th the main difference between your typical cell uh, and a stem cell is whereas a typical cell, when it divides, so you learned in high school that it goes through mitosis, it divides into two cells, making two exact copies of itself. A stem cell is a little different. When it divides, it makes a copy of itself, but then it makes it can make a new type of cell. So uh, in this case, a stem cell can turn into another stem cell and say a cartilage cell called a chondrocyte or a bone cell, osteoblast. Um, or any other uh, any other cell type. So that's that's what differentiates a stem cell. And, and in this way, a stem cell is essentially immortal as you can just keep making copies of itself while at the same time producing new cells. Now, an adult stem cell is different than say an embryonic stem cell. The embryonic stem cell is that cell which uh, you know, you've had ever since you were seven days old, right after you uh, your parents made you, seven days later, you became a ball of embryonic stem cells, which then differentiated into many other types of cells. Once you're born, once you, well, technically before you're born, but when, once you reach this adult stage, um, these cells become more specialized. And so they lose some of their ability to differentiate or turn into, uh, say they can't turn into 200 different cell types, but they can turn into maybe 10 cell types. And the cell that we're most interested in is the one that's listed at the bottom there called the mesenchymal stem cell, and it refers to those cells that are uh, what we call progenitors. They, they can differentiate into a bone cell, a tendon cell, cartilage cell, muscle cell. So uh, when this was discovered, it was very exciting to see that in the lab, actually, this is the man who discovered it. This is our friend, Dr. Kaplan, a professor of biology at Case Western in Cleveland, um, who in the chicken originally showed that bone marrow cells, which he called the MSC or the mesenchymal stem cell, could in the lab differentiate into a muscle cell or a cartilage cell or a bone cell. And he actually formed a company that um, went uh, through the process of trying to develop this technology and develop a, a treatment of, of uh, using these cells. Um, but as it turns out, these cells are readily available throughout our body. And so we'll talk about how we use them currently. First of all, how do they promote healing? Well, I told you originally it was thought that the stem cell would turn into a new cell type, but it turns out that's really just happening in the lab, in the Petri dish. In our bodies, they're functioning in a very different way. So on the upper left there, you see a little stem cell, an MSC, hanging onto a blood vessel. So you see those little pink cells and they're wrapped around um, these blood vessels. It's way more complicated than I'm gonna to explain to you right now, but they do things like regulate your blood pressure and blood flow through those vessels. But if you say stub your big toe, and as a result, the blood vessels become damaged, that damage triggers those sleeping cells, those sleeping MSC cells to become activated. And when they become activated, they start producing molecules that uh, do a variety of different things. And the main categories are stimulating new tissue growth, right? So we damaged our toe. We need to grow back the blood vessels. We need to grow back the damaged tendon or muscle or bone, depending on how bad the injury was. These molecules are produced by the activated MSC to stimulate uh, that tissue regeneration. At the same time, we have to control inflammation. Inflammation to some degree is useful, right? You know, your immune system fights viruses. That's how you get over a cold. It fights cancer cells that may have formed in your body. Uh, and it's useful for removing dead cells. Say when you stub your toe, there's some damaged tissue there. The immune system will clear that out. But if that process goes on too long, that's how people get chronic pain. The inflammatory process is going on way too long. And so the activated MSC has been shown to inhibit that inflammatory phase and, and again, stimulate tissue regeneration. And then it also has some antimicrobial effects. So there've been a number of studies, but uh, showing what is the effect of putting these cells into a knee. So if you put a stem cell in a joint, it stays in the joint for about three to six months. At that time, it's releasing molecules that uh, 
activate the cartilage, activate the bone, activate tendon and ligament, diminish inflammation, uh, modulate the immune system uh, so that um, so that there's less inflammation in the joint, uh, improving blood flow to the tissues, and then uh, this big word down there, anti-apoptosis, which is um, when you have osteoarthritis, you just have the slow loss of cells. The MSC actually um, slows and in some cases reverses that process. So what kind of cells are we using for our patients today in the clinic? Well, the, the richest source that um, is currently FDA compliant, in other words, the FDA will allow us to do, is obtaining these MSC cells either from your bone marrow. On the left, you see what bone marrow looks like, and on the right, from fat. I know people cringe when we talk about bone marrow, they kind of lean back, but it's a, it's a good source of cells. Uh, a richer source of cells is actually the fat tissue. Everybody's excited to donate all their fat. So um, it turns out that there's probably anywhere from 50 to 500 times the number of MSCs per gram of fat compared to bone marrow. But both of these tissues contain the MSC as well as other orthobiologics, molecules, and cells that have been shown to be helpful for treating knee osteoarthritis. Uh, I just want to make this quick point that uh, it's not as big a problem now, but in the past that we've seen a lot of ads from uh, we'll just call them uh, unscrupulous clinics who propose to sell a donor stem cell from, say, birth tissue like amniotic fluid or umbilical cord blood. These are, uh, it's very well known that these are not permitted by the FDA. Uh, there's, if you flip to the next slide, there's actually been some problems where the companies that sell these products uh, have not gone through the proper processes to make sure that they're sterile. Uh, and there's been a number of cases where people have developed uh, sepsis or infected joints ended up in the you know hospital. Uh, and so we just advise our patients, uh, just be aware that currently um, cells from a donor are not permitted by the FDA. If you want cells from a donor, you have to leave the U.S. and go overseas. Uh, but the ones that are compliant with current FDA guidelines, again, are the bone marrow cells, the adipose tissue cells, and then, of course, platelet-rich plasma, which comes from your blood. Now, we could talk about the evidence for uh, using either bone marrow or fat or PRP uh, for your knee arthritis for weeks, literally. There's no shortage of clinical trials on these uh, modalities. And as Dr. Ambach alluded to earlier, there's more evidence, for example, for PRP than there is for cortisone injections. There's more evidence that PRP is effective than there is for hyaluronic acid gel. Uh, injections were common, which are still commonly performed. Uh, and then of course, there are no placebo-controlled uh, knee surgery studies, but whereas there are many randomized clinical tr uh, control trials for platelet-rich plasma and some of these others as well. Bone marrow was sort of the first uh, MSC cell, the first stem cell source that was studied in the early 2000, 2002 time period. Uh, you know, Dr. Kaplan, our friend, discovered the cell in the 90s, but it wasn't until uh, early 2000s that some of these clinical trials were performed. Uh, this is a later study that showed that patients who had bone marrow cells, inject their own bone marrow cells injected into their knees, uh, they improved their pain and function at one year follow-up. Uh, and that was compared to a placebo control, which was hyaluronic acid. Um, there have been many other studies. Uh, if you go back, there's another study that shows that two-year follow-up again uh, the benefits that patients were realizing at one year is actually maintained out to two years. So, you know, steroids will not give you relief at two years. Uh, hyaluronic acid gel will not give you relief at two years. But these are the first uh, treatments that uh, become available that show uh, such durability in their effect. Uh, for adipose cell, so what do we do? We do a little liposuction in the office here. We rinse and wash the fat so that there's no oil or blood in the fat. We mince it up, and this is fully compliant with current FDA guidelines. And then that, those, uh, that tissue, that fat tissue, is injected into the joint. And this is just a couple of studies. The one on the top is actually a funny looking MRI of a knee. You're looking at a side view of a knee. That's the thigh bone up there and then the shin bone below. And what they're measuring is called the gemric. Uh, what they're measuring is the protein content of the uh, technically proteoglycan content 
of the cartilage. So your cartilage cells manufacture this proteoglycan, which is what gives the cartilage its sponginess and, and strength. And what they're able to show that if you injected cells from fat into a patient's knee, that you improve the quality of the cartilage uh, using this MRI technique. Our friend, uh, Dr. Jerry Malenga, and, uh, and our other friend, Dr. Ken Mountner, published papers where patients had um, fat injected into their knee joints, and 12 months later, they showed uh, clinically significant improvements in pain and function and very good safety with no adverse events. And Dr. Ambach, what you didn't do is you put in input in my study, which is a two-year follow-up, uh, showing similar benefit uh, and safety using similar technique. Now, I like this slide because a lot of times folks will say, you know, is there any evidence that these cells can regenerate cartilage? Now, in this particular study, patients, um, th this was done in South Korea by Dr. Ko, and uh, what you're looking on the left there is an arthroscopic view of the knee, and you see the white cartilage there, but then it's thinned out in areas there. So it's like your lawn, you know, there's those holes in your lawn and you see the bone showing through. This is what osteoarthritis looks like if you were to be an orthopedic surgeon and look inside the joint. And in this particular case, uh, a slightly different recipe, but still using cells from fat was injected into the joint. And then a year later, you can see that the cartilage has regenerated. Uh, and if you were to biopsy that cartilage and send it to the lab, you would see that indeed it is the native, uh, what they call hyaline cartilage, and it's well integrated into the rest of the joint. So there's ample evidence. Uh, here's just yet again, MRI evidence showing that after the injection of bone cells or cells from fat, uh, we can see improvement in the quality of the cartilage. So um, in the industry, this is called a disease modifying uh, drug. Uh, it's one thing to decrease pain, right? We inject cortisone that can decrease your pain, but doesn't last. And it certainly does not improve the quality of the joint. Using these cells, whether it's PRP or bone marrow cells or fat derived cells, we now have very good evidence that we are actually improving the health of the joint. And then finally, is it safe? Uh, there were some early concerns about whether or not stem cell therapy would cause tumors uh, or other adverse uh, events. Dr. Centeno, our friend who started a company called Regenex, uh, published this paper where he followed patients for almost nine years, showing that there were no serious adverse events after their treatment. Dr. Hernigau, an orthopedic surgeon in Paris, France, uh, studied his patients for 12 and a half years, showing no increased risk of cancer in patients who had been treated with bone marrow cells. And there have been a number of other, other studies showing long-term safety from uh, cells when you use the patient's own cells. These are not from donor cells. These are using your own cells. So with the time we have left, we're at 1237, Dr. Ambach. Let's take some questions. Good uh, job on time, Dr. Rogers. I'm sorry, I forgot your study. That's actually the largest study that they have published on the use of uh, microfragmented adipose tissue, which is what we use in clinic to treat knee osteoarthritis. Very good study. All right, let's get on the questions. All right, first question, um, someone was saying they had the total knee replacement uh, very recently, still cannot walk, absolute mm. pain. Um, I will never do it to my right knee. How long does stem cell therapy last? Yes, so the cell therapy that we use in the office most commonly is derived from cells from the fat. And we, um, based on some, some measurements that we've done, we only get about one to two million stem cells in that treatment. However, that has been shown to be, uh, in the study that I uh, published with my co-authors, at two-year follow-up, um, uh, I think it was 94% of patients were able to avoid knee replacement altogether. We did not formally do a long-term follow-up, but I do track my patients long-term. I would say on average, we're about four to five years of relief from a single treatment. Um, I'm now at the point where I've been doing this almost nine years, and I've had a couple of folks come back after seven or eight or nine years saying they need a repeat treatment. But to my knowledge, there's no other injection that can give you, you know, more than six months relief, let alone four years relief. That's right. Um, there's a question here regarding an unstable flap tear of the meniscus. 
Um, we didn't get into much detail in the meniscus. We have a separate uh, meniscus talk, but there, is, there are different kinds of tears in your meniscus. Um, there are the degenerative tears, and there are specific kinds of tears that need surgical intervention. Um, and these are uh, what we call like the bucket handle tear, um, the root tears in your meniscus, any huge tears that creates instability in your joint, that creates mechanical symptoms like locking, popping, um, unstable knee. Those are the ones that need, um, majority of them need surgery. The degenerative kind of the meniscus uh, tears usually respond well to conservative treatment. So, um, uh, we we always tell these patients, you know, the the cell uh, injections and the the uh, meniscus um, repair or meniscectomy, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. If, if you do have a meniscus tear that needed surgery, you can still come to us, um, and we can still do treatments for your knee to prevent further uh, degeneration or wearing out and protect the rest of your joint from uh, from further. Uh, arthritis. Um, but there has been studies on acute meniscus tears where in PRP and other uh, cell-based therapies actually did really well in improving pain and function in these patients. Yeah, I think the key take-home point here is that everybody's different. You know, we've seen between you and I together, we've seen more than 50,000 patients in our career. I don't, I don't think any two are exactly the same. So they're definitely... Um, individual variation from one to the other. But in general, you're right. The more unstable the knee, the more severely deranged the meniscus, the less likely cell therapy will be helpful. Uh, but more than 90% of our patients um, are candidates for this kind of treatment. Dr. Rogers, uh, if you want to qualify what you said about cortisone injection, um, this patient, uh, one of the attendees is asking, you said cortisone provides temporary relief because it temporarily impairs the immune system. If you can just clarify that. Yeah, I, um, th there are minimal effects on the systemic immune system that can be measured in the blood. So there's effects on the white cells, for example, circulating throughout your bloodstream. But what I meant to say specifically is it affects the local environment of the joint. So for example, when you um, say you twist your knee and you know, you, you're playing sports or you go for a long hike or something, you'd cause some damage to the cartilage. Uh, uh, or if you're like me, you're over 50 and uh, things just break for no reason, uh, that cartilage damage triggers the immune system because it's the immune system job to clear out some of the debris, which makes room for more healing to occur. Uh, however, um, if there's too much damage, the immune system gets a little bit overzealous and it secretes molecules that actually can be harmful to the joint, harmful to the cartilage and other tissues. So you have all these immune cells within the knee joint. When you inject cortisone, it essentially inhibits the function of those cells. So they're not gonna secrete those toxic chemicals that are harmful to the joint, but it's not providing, the cortisone is not providing a healing effect. And the thing that's nice about cells, your cells, whether they're your platelet cells or their uh, stem cells, say from bone marrow or fat, those cells um, are smart. They have, uh, sensors, receptors on them, they can monitor what is the appropriate amount of activity that they need to engage in to balance out the environment. And so we think it's just a more natural physiologic effect, effect of the cells uh, without the um, sort of uh, what I'll call a carpet bombing effect of steroids, where the steroids are just wiping everything out without any intelligence to it. The Of course, the steroid is uh, out of your system within 48 hours, uh, even though the benefits can last longer than that, of course. Um, and the body reconstitutes itself, the immune system reestablishes itself. Uh, so we don't think there's a long-term downside unless you're getting re multiple repeat cortisone injections. That's not helpful for the tissue. There's a question here regarding the gel treatment, the hyaluronic acid. 
um, the, the gel, so what happens is that when you have osteoarthritis, this hyaluronic acid, which is a major component of your uh, joint fluid, decreases. And so um, supplementing it with HA, with uh, gel injection, can temporarily improve your pain and function in your knee by decreasing inflammation and creating a, uh, an environment um, that's you know, anti-inflammatory and helps with pain. However, it doesn't um, create the same things as, as what a PRP does. And actually, there's been studies that show that for moderate to severe arthritis, the gel injection doesn't work. Um, so the, the, there's a question here regarding the gel not working, and that's probably because of that. You know, it, it's not it's not effective for everybody, just like any other treatment. And the more severe arthritis usually responds to worse. And just like with PRP, there are different types of gels. I think patients are aware. Um, originally, we used what were called low molecular weight uh, hyaluronic acid, and um, and we've learned that the higher molecular weight and the cross-linked um, hyaluronic acids uh, products have more durability. They, they provide a more benef uh, a beneficial effect for a longer period of time. But I will tell you that virtually every study that has compared hyaluronic acid to PRP, PRP has always been shown to be superior to hyaluronic acid. The only time, the only studies that I'm aware of where that did not occur was when the doctor used the PRP, uh, uh, inferior PRP, product, like we said, it didn't have that 5 billion platelets, you know, they, there was a time where we didn't know. And so they would use say 2 billion platelets, and then they would compare that to hyaluronic acid. But every, every study that I've read that where PRP is made appropriately, um, it beats hyaluronic acid, both, both in the number of patients that respond and the duration of the benefit. That's right. Um, Dr. Rogers, can you comment on severe knee osteoarthritis? We we kind of talked about how the cell therapies help uh, even severe arthritis. For how long do they usually last, and what's the improvement? Is it in pain or is it in uh, tissue formation, et cetera? So when we say severe arthritis, that could be one of three things. It could be your pain is severe, it could be your function is severely impaired, or it could be your x-ray just looks really bad. And as Dr. Ambach said earlier, there are plenty of folks walking around with horrible looking x-rays who've never had a lick of knee pain in their lives. So why would some people with such bad looking joints on their x-rays not have any pain? And the reason for that is they probably don't have inflammation or their knee is not unstable or it's not putting pressure on the worn areas in a way that produces pain. And like I said, we've seen so many patients with knee arthritis, everybody's different. Um, and so we have to uh, identify why does that knee hurt? Um, but for those patients who have severe damage to their cartilage, uh, in some cases, even damage to the bone, um, PRP will work for some of those people, but in general, uh, the success rate is less than for patients who have more mild disease. And those patients with more severe disease probably will benefit, um, will have a, a greater probability of success using cells from their own fat, uh, or in some cases with bone marrow. But generally, my go-to now after doing this for more than a decade is that um, adipose tissue has produced the highest um, benefit uh, for the longest period of time for severe knee arthritis. I agree with that. Um, there's also other procedures that we do for patients who's got uh, a bone disease that's associated for uh, with osteoarthritis, wherein we inject the biologic in the subchondral bone, which is the bone underneath the cartilage. And there's some uh, studies that shows that uh, treating the underlying disease bone in addition to treating the joint uh, may have better outcomes as well. So that's called an intraosseous injection or injection into the bone. All right, next. And if you don't want your bone injected, we can use this thing behind me too, right? Shockwave. That's right. Multiple prospective randomized clinical trials showing that in uh, shooting sound waves into the bone can stimulate the bone to heal and regenerate as well. That's right. Um, for those of you who don't like needles <laughs> or would like <laughs> immediate pain relief um, without having to go through intervention, the shockwave treatment is actually really good at at giving you that that relief and at the same time stimulating your cells to uh, to start healing. All right, next question. I'm on blood thinners for a blood clot found behind behind my right knee. Would I be a candidate? Um, 
We consult, we consult with your physician, whoever has been treating you for the blood clot. Uh, we will consult with them to determine if it's safe to withhold the blood thinners for a period of time that is long enough to assure that the platelets, if in the case where we're using platelets, uh, will not be affected. There's some evidence that blood thinners, um, in addition to anti-inflammatory medications such as ibuprofen, aspirin, uh, these have a negative impact on the platelet. Uh, generally, we hold the medicine for a week before and after the treatment, um, and we've had no problem uh, doing that. If the patient cannot hold, if the doctor says, well, they just had their blood clot a month ago, and you're going to be on this now for another six months, uh, and I don't want you holding that medication, there may be other kinds of treatment that we can offer to get you through that short time period. Uh, you know, worst case scenario, there's really no harm in doing the PRP injection in a knee joint. It's a very low risk procedure. Uh, there's really no we're, no, we're not concerned about bleeding with the knee. Um, there may be a 10 to 20% reduction in the efficacy of the platelets, but I, I have many patients who have done just fine uh, with that treatment. That's right. Um, so questions here about the improvement of the cartilage. Um, this is a more complicated topic to discuss because as I said, uh, if you look at all the studies that were published on using cell-based therapies, whether it's PRP or a bone marrow concentrate or fat derived, uh, not all of these studies showed um, uh, structural changes uh, in right. their joints. However, these patients still feel, felt great. They have improved their pain and function. And that's because uh, there's, there's just a lot more that's ongoing inside that joint that creates the symptoms of the patient. So you can have a, a really bad looking MRI and, and be you know, very active. Uh, and so don't get bogged down by what your MRI looks like. Um, with regards to deciding, you know, what treatment am I going to get or am I, you know, going to uh, improve from this treatment? Because every patient is different. And that's why you have that consult with us so that we can identify your risks, kind of give you a reasonable uh, expectation with regards to um, how long the procedure will last, what's the success rate in your uh, condition. We do track our outcomes uh, using a, a, a registry that's called Data Biologics. And through this, we, we can tell you like what was our success rate or what is our success rate on our previous patients based on you know, what the condition is and what treatment we use. So we can give you all that information and then you can decide um, which, you know, if this is a treatment that you think will be um, you know, effective for you or beneficial to do. Yeah, there's a lot of decisions that go into the treatment process, and it starts with an accurate and complete diagnosis. So, for example, some people may have arthritis, other people may have arthritis plus a ligament sprain or, or weak muscles. So, in that latter case, you have to treat the joint and the ligament and get the muscles strong again. So, everything is customized to the individual. And there's a question here about costs, you know. So, uh, currently, insurance won't cover things like cell based therapies, platelet rich plasma adipose tissue, bone marrow tissue, these are not yet covered by insurance. Part of the reason for that is the treatment protocols vary so much from one clinic to the other, as we alluded to earlier. And so I think the insurance companies don't know what they're getting when they, if they were to offer to pay for these things. And that will change. And we're, Dr. Rombach and I are actively involved in improving that situation. Uh, the cost um, is, is borne by the patient. So we believe that it's important that the patient has all the information they need to make the proper decision. Uh, in some cases, we'll share articles with you that you can read. In other cases, we'll show you the data from our database that we've maintained over the years. In other cases, it's just our clinical judgment, you know, based on our years of experience. Um, the cost can be as low as $200 for a single shockwave treatment to as high as $10,000 for a very complicated, severe knee arthritis case. Uh, but we try to keep the risk and the cost and the involvement of the treatment as minimal as possible for the condition that we're dealing with. So there's a question here regarding the treatment process. So if you're getting PRP, uh, you're probably gonna be in the clinic for about an hour. You come in 30 minutes prior to the procedure, we draw your blood, we process your blood in our lab. That takes about maybe 20, 30 minutes. And then we do the procedure which takes about 15, 20 minutes. And then we observe you, make sure everything's good. 
So you're going to be in the clinic for about an hour. Uh, typically, if we give you medication to help with the pain, uh, we would prefer that someone needs to drive, uh, someone can drive you home. Uh, or if we're doing a spine procedure, you know, we typically um, want someone to drive you home. Um, if you're doing a cell-based therapy from fat or from bone marrow, that will take longer. You're probably going to be in the clinic for about two hours. Um, the reason being, we there's an, an additional procedure for us to do to actually uh, obtain the tissue from you, either bone marrow aspiration or a lipo aspiration, and that takes anywhere from you know. 30, 45 minutes, and then we need to prepare your tissue. So you're going to be here for about two hours. The recovery for the two um, therapies are the same, whether you're, you're getting a PRP or bone marrow or fat therapy. Um, the recovery is the same. You start physical therapy after one week. Uh, you take it easy for a week. Uh, you start rehab and then progress as tolerated. Um, and uh, Dr. Rogers also um, answered the cost uh, question. Um, there, there's there's several questions here, Dr. Rogers, on the the decision making process on what tissue or what uh, treatment um, is best for certain conditions. Um, someone was talking about severe osteoarthritis. Do you use PRP? Do you use cell based therapy? How do you decide? Uh, this is the art and science of medicine of uh, having a medical practice, and which I th think is important that you first find a physician who's been doing this more than five or 10 years to make sure not only do they know how to make PRP correctly or collect adipose tissue properly, but also know how to diagnose you properly. That's that's really, I, I can't underscore that enough, how important it is, how many, uh, we've seen so many folks who've been elsewhere and they get some treatment, but the diagnosis was not correct or, or it was incomplete. So some tissue, you know, person had a sprained ankle, but they also had a torn tendon in their ankle. So you gotta treat both the sprained ligament and the tendon. Um, so complete diagnosis is key. The decision, uh, we, we practice something called evidence-based medicine. Uh, I actually gave a lecture. If you have absolutely nothing better to do, all your Netflix queue is empty. You can go to the SDOMG YouTube channel. There's a lecture there on evidence-based medicine, but it's basically based on the premise that uh, when we make a decision, when we help you make a decision as to what's the appropriate course of action, we consider uh, the published scientific literature. What did you know? What did the well done uh, studies show? Uh, what's our personal experience as a physician having treated you know thousands of people? And then what are your personal goals as a patient? What are you, you know? Some of our athletes they can't afford to take a week off of exercise. You know, so we might have to offer something else to them. Other people. Uh, some people want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. Other people just want to be able to walk their dog down the street. So we take, you know, each person's unique goals into consideration uh, and um, come up with what we think is the best uh, treatment plan based on the pros and cons of that treatment. That's right. Um, so we have um, time for one or two more questions. Um, there's, a, there's a question regarding our experience with ankles. Uh, there are other studies on using these cell-based therapies for other joints. Um, there are studies on uh, shoulder joint arthritis, hip joint arthritis uh, as well, uh, less more so on ankle joints. I think the question here is more for ankles. Um, but you know, for mild to moderate OA of the ankle, they, they really do work well. Uh, with regards to bone fracture, um, there's the studies on um, delayed union uh, bone fractures in the long bones where in, in uh, incorporating these cells uh, with the surgical intervention of fixation actually improves the outcomes. Um, so, you know, that, that's something that we can uh, do to help um, your healing process after a surgical intervention, or your surgeons may add that uh, to the surgery if, if they, you know, are willing to do that. With the um, last few minutes, I mean, these are all really great questions and they keep coming in. So thank you for that. And thank you for your interest and, and paying attention here for this last hour. Um, uh, if you want to find original papers uh, that uh, scientific publications and read more about this, uh, we do have a research section on our website. So you can pull up those articles. Um, if you want uh, a, a larger source, uh, as taxpayers, you pay for pubmed.gov. That's pubmed.gov. So you can go to that site. You just type in PRP knee arthritis. You'll see hundreds of studies for that. Um, if you have a specific medical question about your health, we're more than happy to 
go over that with you, you know, either by a Zoom call or by in-person consultation. That's right. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm, there's a lot of interest in this topic and almost always, you know, we've got a full house when we're talking about knee or joint arthritis. Um, but uh, it, for those of you who have missed the, the first several minutes or missed a part of it, uh, you can watch the, the video in our YouTube channel. And we, we try to educate not patients, but the public. Uh, we do these webinars uh, monthly, so watch out for, um, for um, information or postings in our website or in our uh, Facebook um, website with regards to when the next uh, available um, educational activity is. But thank you for joining us. I hope you learned something new. You guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Dr. Ambach. Bye. Bye.